Russia and China continue to dominate the nation state sponsored attack front while North Korea tries to be relevant. And we talk sock building with Jordan Mariello. I'm Randy Watkins, and this is Son of a Breach. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to dive right into the ever evolving solar saga with an update on the Russian attack on solar winds. So the Senate Intelligent Committee is going to begin its hearing on solar winds. It's supposed to be at the 23rd. I think it might have got pushed to the 26th. Regardless, they're going to start calling witnesses. Of course, those being interviewed are going to be the CEOs of SolarWinds, Microsoft, FireEye, CrowdStrike. I believe they'll all be in attendance. What are they looking for is, is kind of the big question. What questions are they going to ask? There was a lot of uh, pose on LinkedIn of, you know, they should ask this question or this question. And frankly, with the education level of a lot of our you know congressional members, I don't think they're going to ask any really solid questions. I think they're going to be asking questions of motive. What were they after? Is this a, a typical attack? And they're going to take answers that they receive at face value. I don't really see them stepping up and challenging some of the answers or drilling into, you know, some of the the answers that are given and, and trying to really understand uh, what is our level of preparedness against nation state sponsored attacks like this. Uh, of course, there will be some political posturing on both sides. Although I'm unsure of the agenda that we wouldn't agree on, uh, regardless of of you know partisanship. So hopefully that doesn't own much of the debate because I do think there is some value to be had from these discussions. And Newberger, she is leading the investigation. President Biden has appointed her deputy national security advisor for cyber and emerging technologies. She came out and, and kind of discussed the scope as, as they've seen it so far with nine federal agencies and 100 private sector companies. We've talked about this before. I mean, there are 18,000 potential victims. So it's 100 today. It could be 200 tomorrow. We don't really know the full scope yet. And I don't know that we ever will. And I know that a lot of the organizations that did contain the compromise binaries, they're starting to launch uh, compromise assessments to see if there's been any interactive attacking since the initial compromise. But, you know, will everybody have the funds to do that? I don't know. There's a lot of talk on what should the government's role be in the response. And we talked about this a little bit last time on the COVID relief bill containing uh, some monies for cybersecurity. And, and, you know, it was kind of important. And there was really a fear of, well, what if the, the COVID bill goes uh, challenged or if it doesn't get passed or if it gets amended? And it looks like they've actually rescinded the cybersecurity funding out of the COVID bill and will likely put it forward in a bipartisan bill. It looks like this cyber funding has actually been pulled from the COVID relief bill because many members of Congress did not see the connection to the pandemic, which I absolutely agree with. Representative Jim Lankovan of uh, Rhode Island, he actually does have quite a bit of uh, experience and and expertise in the cybersecurity realm. He's a co-chair of the Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus. Uh, He said that funding CISA is likely to reemerge with bipartisan support in upcoming legislation, perhaps an infrastructure bill, something like that. Uh, So uh, definitely happier to see it tied to to something potentially a little bit more relevant and maybe something that will gain some bipartisan support and get pushed through pretty quickly. So the funding hopes are still there. The other thing that's coming out of this is you know, potentially foreign policy uh, or an emphasis on foreign policy. How do we respond to these nation state attacks when they don't cause destruction, but they could potentially cause destruction? And, and there's certainly a lot of theft that kind of happened through this breach. You know, Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman uh, Mark Warner from Virginia, he said, quote, we need to make clear to Russia that any misuse of compromised networks to produce destructive or harmful effects is unacceptable and will prompt an appropriately strong response, end quote, uh, in a statement last month. Now, that's interesting. What is an appropriately strong response, right? And and this is a question that I talked about on the first episode with Ben Johnson is, you know, when do you turn a cyber attack into kinetic attack? And, and certainly, I don't think this warrants it. But saying an appropriately strong response without defining what appropriately strong is, is a little bit ambiguous, right? I mean, do we go in and start destroying some of their data? Are we just trying to steal their data? Do we, I mean, 
there's not really a, an appropriately strong response because a cyber attack is is very subjective in w- the damage that it does, right? It's it's all about the perceived value of the information that was stolen or destroyed. Uh, and, and I don't know that you can launch a, a kind of a quote unquote appropriate response to a cyber attack just going apples for apples. So it, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of the hearings, especially from a, a foreign policy stance. But the, the biggest thing that we're going to get out of this, and, and this is a, definitely a positive, is you know never let a good crisis go to waste. And, and I think there's been a lot of organizations that have capitalized on uh, solar winds from a security budget perspective. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I, it's certainly warranted. I, it's no secret that security is typically woefully underfunded. And it it should get some spotlight and get some attention and, and start driving some dollars. So I'm hoping that out of this, you know, compliance requirements or, or different frameworks that come out of it, I, I'm kind of hit and miss on. It, it depends on what the requirements are, who they're going to be applied to, uh, what the penalties are going to be. But I generally think that if you put a bunch of smart people in a room and you say, what are the best practices for security? What should we consider to be you know, a foundational set of security capabilities. I, I think that's going to produce some positive results. And if, if there can be some budget to back that, obviously in favor of that. And Newberger said, quote, it's really highlighted the investment we need to make in cybersecurity to have the visibility to block these attacks in the future, end quote. And that's a, another kind of thing that we look at is, are we blocking or are we detecting and responding? Obviously, we would love to block everything. But with something like a third-party attack that is... You know, a true APT. I mean, something that snuck under the radar of of everybody until they hit a multi-factor device. What level of prevention can we reasonably expect? And then where do we expect detection and response to to pick up at an acceptable level of of damage having already been done? It'll be interesting to see kind of what emerges from the hearings and, and what the final report looks like from the intelligence committee. Some other interesting stuff that that was released about the the solar winds attack, Microsoft came out and and Brad Smith, the president for Microsoft, said, quote, when we analyzed everything that we saw at Microsoft, we asked ourselves how many engineers have probably worked on these attacks. And the answer we came to was, well, certainly more than a thousand, end quote. A thousand engineers were involved in the creation of this attack. That is that is a substantial amount. I mean, that is a, a small army of attackers that are are coding towards a, a single goal, which is a, an impressive feat of teamwork. But it's it's also kind of shocking that these this level of resources would be dedicated to a single attack. And I think that goes to show kind of the value they put on the information. Right? I mean, Microsoft themselves they assigned 500 engineers just to investigate. So, you know, estimating that there are a thousand attackers involved in, in writing actually very little over 4,000 lines of code in a program that had, you know, tens of millions of lines of code, impressive attack all the way around. I'm sure some of those headcount that they're estimating in there was uh, more for reconnaissance after the exploit had been launched and after they gained access. It probably certainly upped the amount of resources that were dedicated to exfiltrating the information, but certainly an impressive number to be dedicated towards a single attack. Pivoting away from Russia to our other favorite nation state, China, uh, interesting story. I read it from Charlie Osborne writing for Zero Day, but it was reported across a number of different outlets. Uh, some research from uh, Checkpoint Research shows that uh, APT31, also known as Zirconium, just a, another Chinese nation state sponsored attack group, they were using a tool for remote access to some older systems, XP, Windows 8, and it was actually a, a privilege escalation tool. They had thought that it was created by the attack group. And what it actually looks like after dissecting it a little bit more is that it was a clone from a tool that was created by the NSA's equation group, which is part of the tailored access operations unit. And this is interesting. I mean, it's a, a privilege escalation tool. It's a, a vulnerability that was patched back in 2017, uh, originally reported by Lockheed Martin. And there, Lockheed Martin claims that they find zero days all the time, and I'm sure they do, but th- they haven't reported many Windows privilege escalation O days since, so, and, and nobody else was really reporting it. So the thought is that this may have been used to target Lockheed Martin some years ago. There, there were some other privilege escalation uh, exploits found inside this toolkit as well. And the interesting thing is, you know, four of those exploits were part of that shadow brokers dump that came out back in 2017. But the original two that they found in there that's leading to leading them to believe this is a clone, 
those were not part of the Shadow Brokers League. So, I mean, the the Chinese actors were able to get a hold of this. And the thought is that maybe it was mid-flight. So maybe they were mutually occupying a network and and you know, APT31 was able to watch the equation group use these exploits to escalate privileges. But this also isn't the first time it's happened. Right? This happened, it was actually documented back in 2019 by Symantec when it was APT3 at the time. They, were, they found equation group tools in use from them as well. And this was prior to the Shadow Brokers leak. This was back in 2016 is when they, they first found APT3 using these exploits. So there's definitely some you know, kind of spy versus spy stuff going on between the nation states with China. And we'll definitely look for that to ramp up. I, I don't think that's going anywhere. I think Russia is kind of the tip of the iceberg and, and China is going to capitalize on the attention being paid to Russia to kind of do their own bidding in the background and, and hopefully not get caught while everybody's heads down trying to recover from the solar saga. Now, in stark contrast to Russia and China, who are using O'Days and stealing uh, our government's tools to escalate privileges and, and kind of looking into nine different government agencies and hundreds of private organizations, uh, not to be outdone, North Korea sneaks onto the scene. Bruce Sussman reporting over at Secure World detailed the U.S. DOJ's report that they've recently released on nation state sponsored attacks from North Korea with the goal of monetary theft and, and I guess, reputation building to an extent. They linked this back to the uh, Reconnaissance General Bureau, the RGB, which is part of the the DPRK, the Democrat People's Republic of Korea, and uh, more specifically, Lazarus Group, which is APT38. Essentially, North Korea is trying to steal, uh, so far they've targeted $1.3 billion from some miscellaneous targets like banks, ATMs, crypto exchanges, online casinos, and movie studios. There was a, a big story a while back about ATMs that were continuously getting hit and, and people pulling out tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and that was apparently getting funneled back to North Korea. And then you probably remember there was a, a movie came out that was depicting Kim Jong-un in, in North Korea from Sony Studios. And, and they got hit with some attacks from North Korea and, and Lazarus Group. So there's been some actual charges levied against a, a couple of the folks they've identified over at the DOJ, uh, which is interesting. It's also an interesting take for a nation state. I mean, we, we often talk about the motivations behind different attacker groups. And usually when you're looking at monetary influences, it's typically a crime syndicate, right? And, and when you move on to nation states, they're after intellectual property or foreign policy information. It, it, it's interesting to see the kind of the motive behind this nation state attacker being cash, although I certainly understand what the sanctions that are in place, but I, I don't know if they're going to really strike fear into the hearts of you know our, our nation's leaders if they're out there uh, kind of stealing crypto wallets. And, and trust me, I understand. I'm not trying to downplay it too much. I do understand that they're doing, uh, you know, they're attacking crypto exchanges, which does affect kind of a little bit of everything. And it has the potential to be much more dangerous, but you know, right now it's it's almost a refreshing thing to deal with, given how much we've been put through with solar winds over the last few months. So, primary attack means uh, phishing and malware downloads. I mean, they attempt to get people to download some software that they can link into the crypto uh, exchange to do automated trading, things like that, and then they just steal your wallet. So, as always, vigilance is key with that. Other thing to note, though, that, that is a little bit more interesting and kind of points towards some potential expertise over there is the fact that they're planting false flags to make it look like other nation states. And this goes back to almost motive. They're, they're specifically targeting a, a few different nation states and, and trying to kind of paint them with, with these attacks. But like I just talked about, most of the time, nation states are not going to be after money, right? They're not hacking movie studios. They're not going after AMC movie theaters. So it's, it's kind of interesting that they would use that brush to paint all the attacks in other news and talking about kind of defending ourselves against attacks, Critical Start will be releasing their annual SOC report. This details everything from, you know, the percent of false positives that are being dealt with to what analysts feel like their job is. So to talk through that and, and to talk about how do you build a SOC, how do you focus a SOC, where do you hire your SOC analysts from, I'd like to welcome on our guest, Critical Start's very own SVP of Managed Services, Jordan Mariello. Hey, thanks for having me, Randy. Happy to be here. For those who haven't met you, give us a brief background into your security career and your current function at Critical Start. Sure. 
So started my career uh, in the military, working in, in the Navy, uh, what we call, we call our jobs rates in the Navy, whereas everybody else calls them MOSs, but the rate was called IT. A lot of amazing training there, had a lot of great exposure to some in- incredible technologies too as well. From there, I went to work for the government for a little while, but eventually after multiple trips overseas and then lots of time away from my family and a newborn son, um, I made the jump to the commercial world. Spent time at Experian Financial Services Company. Many people are familiar with as a credit bureau. Um, they're really a data analytics company, but uh, the, most people know them for being a credit bureau. And I was there for about eight years, led the global security operations uh, organization there, part of build out from the ground up all the way up to where we had, you know, a, a three continent fall the sun model 24 seven sock with people in Allen, Texas, Nottingham, England, Kuala Lumpur. Um, and uh, it was a phenomenal opportunity, great place to work. Love the people there. So a lot of great guys that, uh, and, and girls for that matter, um, that I worked with that were absolutely incredible. From there, uh, came here to Critical Start. Uh, initially, I uh, was the uh, CTO on the uh, software side too as well, where we built out, built out the SOAR platform um, and now run the managed services division, which encompasses SOC, threat intelligence, security engineering, some engineering components, and then as well as our customer care organization, which is support, onboarding and implementations, uh, customer success. Excellent. So definitely want to pick into that expertise quite a bit. You've built out multiple SOCs. Uh, and, and when we look at the security industry as a whole, one of the things that we hear over and over, and we've heard this for years, there's a massive headcount shortage in the space, uh, and it's not going to be solved anytime soon. You know, And we've looked towards automation to fill that gap. What do you see as being contributors to the shortage in headcount entering the security space? So I, I think a big part of it is simply the ability to get high quality training. You know, there are, there are not a lot of great training programs that are taking people from entry level security skills to competent security analysts that can start a job they want it. And it's just not really out there. Even a lot of the certification programs, they're, they're very narrow in focus and they give a very specific set of knowledge, but it's not incredibly practical. In a lot of cases, and so it's hard to turn out people that are truly ready for work in some of the more technical jobs that we actually require. A little bit different than you might see in, like, you know, uh, IT administration for Microsoft, where there's uh, lots of very practical, very detailed certifications that give exact skills on how to run Microsoft Server and Active Directory and Azure and all these other things. And we don't have a lot of that for security. So a lot of what we have from a personnel perspective and a talent perspective is learned on the job. People get into the field and they do journeyman training. And we still see this a lot, even at our company, we still see this a lot. And that, that is what I think is one of the biggest contributors to the shortage. The other thing is that there is a significant barrier to entry to expertise, right? Obviously, like everybody knows like, hey, there's tons of money to be made being a high level security expert, but man, it, to get there to the high levels where, where some of those higher salaries are, it takes a lot. It, the effort is really significant. You'll be spending years, five to seven years of solid learning and you have to be willing to put in that investment. And I think sometimes that that actually word some people off from it too. Yeah, there's the old catch-22 in security of you need a job to get the expertise, but you can't get the expertise without the job. And I know that holds true in other industries as well, but it's particularly you know, tried and true in, in, inside of security. So oftentimes the first job that's available for an analyst, they're likely not qualified for unless they can get into an entry-level SOC position and, and really kind of earn their stripes there. And to that extent, how are uh, how is Critical Start? How are you identifying analysts? How are you? Where are you getting your analysts from? So one of the advantages we have as as a service provider is kind of predictability and growth based on our business plan, which really lets us figure out you know when do we need to hire and how much do we need to hire and that kind of planning on our side gives us a distinct advantage in how we go and hire. So for us, we actually go and build the people that we need. Right. And so we separate out the technical skill from the right kind of person for the job that would be successful in it. And so we will go into and, and recruit from local organizations, local colleges, and find people who are passionate learners who want to get into the industry and have a high aptitude, high IQ, good problem solving skills. And, and then obviously for us, incredibly important too, good culture fit um, for the organization. And, and then we will train them. That, that advantage is that we can take the time to do that. 
as well as part of our plan is, is we can put six to eight weeks into training a resource in, in a formalized training program from start to finish. And that for us is an investment back in our company, in our business, and, and as a service provider, eventually even in making revenue. Not always easy for everybody else to kind of make that kind of investment to as well. But but for us, man, when we're looking for people with it's it's not about going out to find the experienced security analysts, but we we can take the advantage of, hey, can I find someone that we think can be successful as a security analyst? And then we'll train them and help them get there. I think the big thing that you mentioned there is kind of predictability in, in what you need to staff because you never want to hire for the growth that you've already experienced. You always want to hire ahead of the growth so you can invest the time in training those resources. And that allows you to go after maybe the, the more fresh analysts that are out there and, and really look for uh, potential rather than existing expertise, which, I mean, kind of lowering that barrier to entry certainly makes it easier to hire. We can go after you know the students fresh out of college when you're doing the interviews and you're looking for the kind of quality and, and potential and, and aptitude, how are those interviews structured? What kind of questions are being asked? Who's conducting those interviews? And so we're one, let's go to who's conducting, right? And, and it's the team that actually is going to be working with those people, right? So security analysts hiring security analysts. And obviously there's manager approvals for hiring and all those things that you would expect. But when we look at who's really screening the people that are coming in, it's the people that are going to be working with them. That's important to us, especially in the SOC, because nobody can recognize another good security analyst, like a good security analyst, in my opinion. Um, even even me now being disconnected, even though that's in my background and I spent years doing that, now being in leadership for a long time, I'm even not yet at as high of, as aptitude as some of my security analysts are because I'm just not as up to date. So put the guys who are up to date, who can ask the more relevant questions. And then when we talk about like, well, what kinds of things are we talking about? What are we questioning? So first and foremost, there's going to be like behavioral questioning. Right? How does this person respond to scenarios? How will they respond in a work environment? What kind of attitude did they have? How do they look at potentially conflict situations, but problems too as well? Right? And then how do they think? How do they problem solve? Are they good problem solvers? Um, and it's not just about when you ask, you ask a lot of problem solving questions, you can hear some of these ridiculous questions in interviews that people ask. And, and a lot of times there's not a right or wrong answer. Like one of them, one of our analysts likes to ask is there's a giant stack of pancakes. Which one do you prefer to be the top pancake or the bottom pancake? Right? Well, there's no right answer to that question, right? It's about how do you process the data? Do you ask more questions, right? Okay. Well, what's going to happen to these pancakes and these pancakes being eaten? Right? But what, what about the top pancake? Where will the person start top or bottom? Like, and that kind of thing, you know, allows us to process for us. Like, how do they think about the problem? Do they stop and first collect more data? Are they trying to understand the why we're asking it and, and what's the actual problem we're trying to solve? Very common phrase here at Critical Start. And that's important for us. So we do have a lot of problem solving questions where they're kind of abstract, right? But we're trying to look and get an idea for how does somebody think? What's their process? Um, do they collect data, analyze? What are the critical thinking skills? And then um, we like to throw a good bit of humor in there too in our interview process and see how people respond to that. I do think it's important. Uh, obviously, we, Randy and I are both firm believers in this. We got to have a lot of fun while we work too. And and if somebody can't laugh at a joke, even in the middle of an interview or tell us a joke in the middle of an interview, sometimes that could come up with a negative bark. That is my favorite thing that kind of throws the interview for a loop is like, hey, what's your favorite knock-knock joke? And, and it, it always takes people by surprise. Like, oh, I expected to answer questions, not ask uh, or not give knock-knock jokes. One of the things that you hit on is is kind of distilling information, uh, and and that seems to be uh, almost a, a key indicator of of success is the ability to distill information very very quickly, get to the root of what you're looking for within a long article. So one of the things I like to do for interviews, especially for folks who are just trying to break into the security industry, is ask somebody to you know tell me what their the latest blog was that they read. Hey, what was the last security article that you read and what was the point of the story? And if they don't have anything off the top of their head or if I want to kind of change it up, I'll take one in and I'll say, "Hey, read through this real quick. Let me know what your thoughts are." And see how concise they can get as quickly as possible because that's really a good indicator of how quickly they'll be able to learn, not just kind of pour through all the information and take it word by word. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, we we do that too. We do ask about current events a good bit because we want to see like are you engaged? Is this something you're passionate about? And, and if you are, like, how much are you actively following it and pursuing this on your own? Are you, are you trying to take some of the avenues out there for learning, knowledge forums, you know, uh, the Reddit 
you know, threads. You can be on all these places that you can go to get data in our industry right now. But then you're right, like distilling information is is a key skill. And and a lot of times, like if, if you're in security and you can't do that with how much we have to consume data wise, I mean, how many breach reports do we read a week? How many new, you know, threat actor updates and threat intelligence reports do we need a week? Like if if you didn't have the ability to distill the information, the only thing you would do is consume information and never turn around and take any action. Yeah, exactly. So when you look at these analysts that come in, uh, they get onboarded or they're, they're going through the onboarding process. What are the skills that Critical Start is training the employees? Because our training is all in-house developed, right? And it's based on kind of your learnings from experience and some kind of some military tactics baked in and then the, the newer knowledge that we've gathered since and, and the different products and tools that we work with. What does that training look like for analysts? Yeah, so some of the lessons that that I learned kind of along the way, and now got hard to believe twenty years of experience in the industry now, is that it, everything is built on fundamentals. And then a lot of times when we were first building training programs, uh, and this is a lesson we really learned at Experian too as well, and and some phenomenal guys that helped build the training programs there. And shout out to some of those guys like Anthony and Wyatt and some of those guys that just did phenomenal work there and helping to build that out. But is that it, when we would try to build more advanced skills, a lot of times people would come in and they even have college education and had certifications. And, and then we would jump into, let's talk about you know security problems. And then, you know, what would actually happen is we would end up drilling back down to, well, hold on, this is how TCP IP actually works. Right? It seems like we have a different note. That, that's not how IP addressing works. Let's go back to that. Right? And, and so we actually start from the bottom up and we go all the way down to, okay, you know, here is how these basic protocols that the internet is built on works. Here is how IP addressing works in DHCP, TCP IP, UDP, DNS, um, your basic routing protocols, right? And so it's kind of the, we start with a course on, this is how the internet works, if you will. Does everybody really understand this? Do you really understand how recursive DNS works? Do you really understand how the flags and TCP work? And we fundamentally build that up. And then we, from there, we begin to add additional system knowledge, right? So how do systems function, operating systems, you know, basic authentication and passwords and security procedures and ACLs, right? And then, you know, from uh, we spend a lot of time on Windows, obviously, so we do a lot of analysis on Windows systems most of the time, but then, then things like the system backend and DLLs. And so we build up all these fundamentals on how the networks work, how the systems work before we even start. We're probably spending two weeks on building up fundamental skills for people because at that point, then when we begin to layer on a concept like, Okay, something really simple and security, right? But like, how does port scanning work? Well, if you don't understand how TCP and UDP work first or IP works first, you're never going to get how port scanning worked, right? And so, as we begin to build on that and then add how, what, how do vulnerabilities apply and, you know, how does logging in work if you don't understand what a hash is, that's going to be a problem. And, and so, we begin to build that up. So, we kind of go from those fundamental skills, network skills, system skills basic security skills. And then we kind of have, you know, at the level one analyst, what would I would consider like almost like an intro to ethical hacking? Um, you know, not not quite like your CEH level course, but you do need to understand malware and exploitation and different types of compromise and implicit trust in systems and 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 get a knowledge of that so you can understand what's happening when you're analyzing events. You you mentioned the CEH and and our training is all developed internally, but for those folks who aren't going to be at Critical Start or for you know organizations that are building out their own SOC, what are some recommended courses that analysts can take? There's there's so much free training available. Where do you even start in in building out your analyst capabilities? So I, I recommend a lot of free courses to people these days. Just there's so many good ones that are out there right now. Obviously, like some of the the websites that are out there, like Udemy and Coursera and edX. There's phenomenal material on all of these sites right now that's free. Um, but one of the things I often tell people, again, going back to fundamentals, is, is I'll ask questions like, hey, have you ever done a course on basic networking? Have you ever done a course on Linux fundamentals? Have you ever done a course, you know, a basic computer programming course? Because we get a lot of people with IT management degrees, and then they want to get into security, and you don't even understand basic programming concepts. That, that actually will limit your ability to progress over time. You, you do have to have that to, to understand how attacks work, how 
PowerShell scripts work, how exploits work and memory works and all those things that apply from a programmatic perspective to understand things like exploitation, buffer overflows, heap overflows, you know, um, PowerShell malware, things like that. Like if you're going to do that well, you're going to need to understand programming. So a great course for that, like that's on edX is uh, Harvard has a course called CS50. Great intro to programming course on there. There's a, a Linux fundamentals course on edX too as well that I recommend to people all the time. There are people who want to better understand some of like the privacy side of security too as well. There's a guy, Nathan House on Coursera and Udemy that has several basic intro to security courses that really cover like privacy and system setup and and even endpoint security too as well. Those are all really good uh, courses that are out there that are either free or super cheap that most people can afford to do. Certifications, I, I feel like they're hit or miss these days because... You know, certifications are not updated all of the time. And so, you know, what you when you get on a two to three year update cycle for a cert, you know, two to three years in our industry is, is a long time. And, you know, I, yeah, I'm sure you got plenty of comments on that. Yeah. I mean, it, it security is so evolving that I, mean, that's one of the reasons that it's hard to build any formal education around it in college, right? And that, that contributes to the lack of security resources. There's not a lot of degrees around cybersecurity because it's so hard to keep it up to date. I think one of the things you touched on that I like is, you know, kind of look at the fundamentals. Those don't change very frequently. Yep. So if you look at things like a, a really, really basic cert, net plus, sec plus, getting the, the fundamental understanding of what's involved inside of networking and security. Those are good primer courses, good starter courses, at least a good baseline of knowledge that should exist within a SOC analyst to uh, as kind of a, a getting started place on top of those edX and Coursera courses. Yeah, I, I do think, and I, and I do recommend both the Network Plus and Security Plus to people fairly often. And I know not everybody looks at those as for like high levels of expertise, but I think one of the people, one of the things people have to consider when recommending courses or talking to people getting in our industry is that we have our own language. And if you're not even familiar with our vocabulary, coming in and starting a job in our industry is very, very hard. And a lot of those certs, a Network Plus actually, I think does a good job of building up network fundamentals. So I do recommend that course if you want to get a good understanding of things like IP addressing, right? Like if you don't understand how a 32-bit IP address works and what it means to say an octet and how that applies to 32-bit IP addressing, you should probably go back and take that course. Just, you know, guidance there, right? But we also, when we talk about SEC Plus, like, Hey man, we we have all kinds of terms and words and phrases and methodologies and things that we talk about all the time. Frameworks that are very commonplace that we could get in a conversation. Randy and I are often in the pre-sales environment quite a bit at Critical Start, and we might be in a conversation, and you know we might talk about five different frameworks in five minutes with a customer, and this is just commonplace knowledge. And if you were thrown in, it would sound like Greek. You know, you'd have no idea what we're at, we're talking about at all. So I, I do think those help to bring people up to speed on a lot of that. I think some of the technical certs, there are some good ones. The CEH, I did mention that. That's it. I would say it is very beginner level ethical hacking. You, you, like you're not, you can't take the CEH and go start a job as a pen tester, right? It's giving you a basic knowledge of what exists out there and and what kinds of things you need to go learn and develop expertise on. The, the guys from offensive security do have some certs in that area too, as well. If we're talking about those specific skill sets and pen testing and things like that, the OSCP, the OSCE, they're, they're good certs. Um, again, updating becomes a problem even there because when you build courses that are that complex, man, uh, updating the OSCP course and pen testing with Cali courses, you know, with the giant lab they have and everything that goes with it, it's got to be just a nightmare. Yeah, and, and I almost think that the the certifications, all, all of the the little acronyms that people put after their names, they come in ebbs and flows when it when it comes to importance. I mean, it really just shows your ability to go above and beyond and and achieve something that's additional. Uh, but I think also listing those Coursera and edX courses is just as good, and those courses are much more relevant and up to date. On the on the cloud front, there's obviously a lot of things moving into cloud security. I I mean, AWS has free certs. There's a ton of Microsoft training on edX. I know Google has their own kind of training platform. What are the the beginner courses that you would recommend for those cloud platforms? Yeah, there there are some great ones out there. A lot of our guys do the AWS Cloud Architect, Cloud Security courses that are out there right now. 
because it, although they are often AWS focused, so many of the things translate across multiple cloud environments. And because they are kind of, you know, not, not everybody may agree with this, but kind of the original architects of scalable cloud infrastructure, it, they, they, they have the outline of what everybody else has done as a part of what they do too as well. And so if you start there, you will learn a lot. Um, Microsoft does have some great search for stuff on Azure right now too as well. And one of the things that we've learned in that process is the quality of training that they're giving to their customers right now. And those courses is really, really good. I've been very impressed with it. I've done a couple of the courses myself as we've gotten more and more involved in working with Azure tool sets and security and even in our SOC. And I've been very impressed with the quality of the training, the content, and, and how much I learned even then, even years of experience with cloud technologies now. There's still plenty that I learned in going through some of their certifications. So both AWS and Azure have great courses. I'm not as familiar with Google's, unfortunately, in that regard. I just haven't done as much with GCP myself, but both of those are recommended. But most of our guys on our kind of standard path from you know, coming up in the SOC and then a lot of our guys from the SOC, we have growth paths that go to multiple other jobs in the company because we have invested a lot in those guys and we want to keep them. We don't want them just leaving. So they go a lot of the paths to engineering include certifications for AWS that they need to go get, certifications for Azure that they need to go get. But we've probably focused more on AWS, even in our specific tools for our company. So it's, it's a little heavier towards that side. Yeah, the, the lab environments with all of those certifications as well are just phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's very practical. It's not like the, uh, you know, the CISP where you're reading a couple of massive books and then going out for a, a four hour exam. It's, it's much more practical oriented. You get to write your own scripts, launch your own CFTs. They're, it's phenomenal training. Yeah, I completely agree. So you, you hire the analyst, you train the analyst, you built out your SOC. Now, what we have to deal with is, you know, hundreds of alerts, thousands of alerts that come in and, you know, critical start, we, we just released or we're in the process of releasing a, a study uh, that one of the stats was kind of shocking. We asked what analysts thought uh, their primary function was. And the number one selected answer was get through as many alerts as possible. And there's a lot of risk to that approach. What do you see uh, as being the primary risk to that approach? And how do organizations that aren't using a, a backend like ours, how do they get through those alerts efficiently? How do they point their analysts in the right direction and, and really get the most use out of the analysts? Yeah, well, one of the things that we always talk about when it comes to SOC is that you know prioritization should really be a matter of context, not just you know the, the priority of the alert that was assigned by the CVE by the vendor who wrote the signature that's doing the detection or whatever, right? Like that, that is so important, you know? So if you're going in and, and you're looking at this simply from like a volume metric problem, let's just get to 10%, 20%. Let's just do all of the criticals, whatever, you know, that, that decision-making process is, you have to understand that you are accepting some measure of risk. You don't have enough resources whether it's technology to, and, and you know a budget to buy technology to do the automation, or whether it's people, or whether it's you know availability for budget to outsource, it, you don't have the resources to get through 100% of those. So, what are you going to get done? And and then more importantly, why? Why are you going to get those specific things done? So instead of just looking at it and saying I'm going to get all the criticals, I, I think you're better suited in my opinion, and, and obviously this comes with years of experience in, in SOC now, you're better suited to figure out like what are the critical assets you really need to protect? What does the business actually care about? What will impact us? What will impact revenue or reputation or you know the, the, the crown jewel of whatever your organization is? And then focus on that. So a lot of organizations, if you kind of shrink that picture right down to whatever the key components of the business are, they, that, that might actually be manageable for a smaller staff. You, you might be stretched and you still might need to make investments and add automation and have the right tools, but you might be able to manage that. Whereas if you're looking, you know, I mean, we have some customers, you know, 30,000, 40,000 endpoints and three IT guys, right? They, it, you're just, it, it's never going to be feasible for you to do a hundred percent alert, you know, resolution like we talk about. 
Yeah, and the, the context thing is really the key because when we talk through pre-sales, I mean, if you've ever seen a critical start demo, we talk about the two primary ways of getting rid of alerts at scale, which is input-oriented and priority-oriented. Input-oriented being just kind of shutting things off or really tailoring your detection logic to only spit out very high fidelity alerts that are more likely to be true positive. Priority-oriented, only looking at the criticals and the highs and in kind of not looking at the mediums and lows, but that's always under the blind context that you were just talking about, right? The, it, hey, it was assigned by the vendor and this is the best thing I have to go on. If you can do priority oriented in a way that takes the context of the business and wraps it into the priority, now you're actually talking about risk mitigation on a measurable level and, and you can start to uh, accept, truly accept the risk as a business decision of those, those low and medium. So the, the context is, is absolutely critical there. Yeah, completely agree. I think most people, they go into it and it's just a matter of, you know, like like you said, it's just input oriented. How do we reduce the noise overall and turn off lower fidelity items? Or, you know, we're just going to do all the criticals, but then, you know, it's like, hey, a medium on your CEO's laptop is probably pretty important. Or, you know, maybe a low priority in the cardholder data environment at 2 a.m. That's probably pretty important. You might want to look at it. And and it might be way more important than a critical on, you know, the guest Wi-Fi, you know, from some browsing activity, right? Like, hey, you responded to that critical from your guest Wi-Fi and nobody looked at the medium from your CEO's laptop. Like, you know, it's the the priority that's assigned to the alert doesn't necessarily matter to priority to the business. Yep, exactly. And I think we can point to probably a number of breaches that have happened because of those approaches being used without the context of the business and what was actually important to the business. We won't name names here. Yeah. (laughs) Jordan, thanks for joining. Always a pleasure. Yep. Thanks for having me, Randy, man. That is it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any suggestions for future episode topics, please let me know. Be sure to follow Critical Start on all the socials, the the Twitter, the LinkedIn, and everything else. And we will see you next time on Son of a Breach. (laughs) 